gun Ramos looking like he's got one more good run Sips a little shaky But his heart is still true Oh how that dog loves hunting with me and you Sporting dog adventures run boy run Everything you need is here under the sun the Sporting Dog Adventures podcast is proudly brought to you by Soggy Acres Retrievers. Remember, everyone deserves a Soggy Dog. Hey, welcome to the Sporting Dog Adventures podcast. I wanted to go over a topic today that is very much a wise tale, which is something that is passed on from generation to generation about dog training uh, when you have hunting dogs. And... It is something that I hear every litter that I send home and multiple, multiple times at sports shows when I am uh, there with a booth talking to people about dogs. That topic is the phrase that I hear, which is often said, and that is that someone wants to get their young dog out with their buddy's dog, neighbor's dog, or their old dog so that they can learn how to hunt by being around that dog. Now, I will tell you that this is a misnomer and that uh, it is not a way to train a dog to just have them with another dog that is out in the field. And if you find someone that has this idea and they act like they know about training, don't just walk, but run from them. As you can hear my dogs wrestling in the background. Uh, Run from them because they don't know what they're talking about. A good dog is bred to hunt. They're bred with drives. They are bred with the ability uh, to not only be trained, uh, but perform in the field. And... What you are actually going to do with this dog is you're going to take their training and with training you're going to harness that ability and make them hunt for you. So basically you're taking a dog when they have drive that if you look at it as them being self-employed, which is a nice way to say that they don't listen, and you're going to be giving them obedience and control so that they hunt with you as a team. So you're training them to understand that they are hunting with you, for you, and that they have to listen to you in the field. When you have someone that has the misnomer that they are going to have a dog that will magically learn how to hunt from someone else, what I tell people is that this is the point where you need to realize they did not train their dog properly. Because if they did, they would tell you, you need to do your obedience, you need to do your e-collar training, force fetch. So your dog is not only going to not be trained properly, but going to pick up bad habits. Uh, When I talk to clients, I will tell them that these are the same people that the reason when you're out in the marsh or at a, uh, a public hunting ground, you think that many, many people have named their dogs the same thing, which that is... Pardon the expression, damn it. You hear them, damn it, damn it, damn it, as they're upset at their dog because the dog's not listening. And they'll get very upset with the dog and blame the dog when, in essence, they need to blame themselves because they didn't train the dog properly. Training a dog is about control. So you need to have a dog that understands through their training as well as through reinforcement of commands that they hunt for you. With that said, if you get a dog that is not uh, bred properly, and that means it's not just because the dog is a hunting breed, a dog that's not bred properly where they don't have the proper drives or trainability, that affects it as well. You can't make a dog hunt. I can take a dog that's low drive uh, and low desire and make them into a substandard duck hunting dog because you can use force fetch and force them to go out and get something. Now, there's still no guarantee they'll want to do it all the time. They may have times they hunt and times that they do not. I've had dogs in where I'm working with the dog and I'll call the owner and and tell them, hey, 
I don't know what to tell you except for the fact that I can't make this dog go. And many times it is, please just keep working with the dog. I'm see They're seeing progress. I'm like, yeah, you're seeing progress, but you're not seeing progress to the level of what it would be worth it as far as the financial investment you're putting forward. It is pointed out to me by these clients that they have it. It's their only dog. They don't have multiple dogs. And even if the dog is substandard, it will work for them because they can't get a second dog. So again, make sure you're starting out with something that is a wonderful uh, mix of drive, determination, and good breeding. And then go from there. You also want to make sure that your health is important because you don't want to invest a bunch of money in a dog to have them have preventable uh, genetic issues or preventable um, uh, physical issues. Uh, so that you are putting a bunch of money in and then losing your investment. So again, make sure that you're working on that and then you're going to put your time in. You'll hear from your uncle, your brother, your grandma's aunt's pen pal that the way to teach them to hunt is to put them with another dog. Realize again, this is doing nothing but give you bad habits for your dog when they're out there in the field. Now your training, you're looking at, through a professional uh, like myself, you're looking at three months of training so that you can have a dog all the way through what they, what they should be. The other thing that might as well cover now is I'm going to take my dog out, not really let him hunt, but just let him get the experience. There is no reason to take a dog out to, quote, get them experience because, again, they need to be fully trained or they're going to be gun shy or they're going to have bad habits that you're going to have to fix at some other point. I understand the excitement of having a puppy and taking that dog out. My first dog, the first time she was shot over was when we were in the field. I didn't know what I was doing. I took her out. I'm like, well, I better shoot around her and had her right next to me and shot. Not the way to go. You can make a dog gun shy that way. I was fortunate I did not. But if you have a dog that's gun shy, about 75% of them are not recoverable, as in they are not going to be able to hunt. So do your step by step. Don't just take them along to get them experience. They're going to get their experience once they're fully trained and under control. Because again, they are bred, if bred properly, they are bred to have all of the ability as a hunting dog. And your training is going to rein that in and teach them that they hunt for you. So I hope that helps. A little bit of a different topic for today, but I figured it was a good one to cover. Next, in our hunting tip, we're going to talk about the difference in colored bumpers when you, when you train your dog. So stay tuned for that right after this. This portion of the podcast is proudly brought to you by Boucher Automotive in Janesville, Wisconsin. You've got your new dog. You're going to need some things for training. You go to the store and you look and you're going to get bumpers that you can work with your dog on retrieving. So you're going to do this right. You're going to work through force fetch. Um, you're going to do uh, marked retrieves with your dog. So what do you get as far as colors? Far too often I hear people say, I got the orange bumpers because they were bright and you could see them. And I wanted my dog to do better when they were out training. When you use orange bumpers, that is a bumper that we use in training uh, lingo for blind retrieves, which means they cannot see it. Dogs are colorblind. So you want to get white bumpers if you're throwing in a dark background, or they have black bumpers, or they have black and white bumpers that you can get to kind of hedge your bet. But you want to go with a white bumper in most instances so that it's highly visible and so that the dog can see it. If you're going with orange bumpers, again, those are ones you're going to use when you're teaching blind retrieves, and that is on an older dog that's in their transition or their, their finished training. So start with your white bumpers. I like to have a mix of the three inch bumpers and a mix of two inch bumpers so that I'm working with them on both. And then they have different sized uh, items that they're, uh, that they're retrieving in the field. So, don't buy the orange bumpers, buy the white bumpers so that you have the ability to teach them marking. If you want to make it even better, you can actually take some type of a flagging um, tape or ribbon and tie it onto the bumper so that it has movement as it's flying through the air because the dog will pick that up. So I hope that helps on this week's training tip. Next, we're going to talk about our hunting in the field 
and tackle the issue of should you hunt a spot two days in a row or how long do you rest it. All that after this. Hunt. This part of the podcast is brought to you proudly by Mech Outdoors. Hunting season has arrived. You've done your job. You've scouted. You've got the best spot for the upcoming weekend. There's birds all over. You know that this is the spot for you. And you are going to just smack them. You're going to have that great hunt. We don't get many of them in a year. This is going to be your chance. At least in Wisconsin, we don't get that many a year. This is going to be your chance so you can really, really put birds on the water And have a wonderful, wonderful hunt. Or birds in the field for that matter. I'm going to tell you about a tale of our teal season where we had a field that had water next to it. And the teal were in the water. There were mallards in the field. It was public land. My son and I went in there. We looked. There were birds everywhere. There was a mix of mallards wood ducks and teal. The teal obviously were staying on the water. The other birds were not going far to feed. So we actually waited until the second day. We hunted this pond that was off of this field where these birds were hitting. And I mean, it was just one of those magical spots where you look and you're like, wow, this is going to be good. And we got our limit of teal, which was six each. Inclination would be, we had a great hunt. We should hunt there the next day. I did not do that because Throughout my experience with uh, hunting on TV, I had many hunts all over Canada and the U.S. And I will tell you with a straight face that when I hunted the same spot twice, we never, ever had a good hunt. We had some days that were solid hunts, but it was never as good as the day before. So we made the conscious decision to wait on this field and this pond, and we actually hunted it five days later. And on that hunt, we had even more birds that were in the area. And it turned out to be a really, really fun hunt. So the temptation is, especially when you're hunting in an area like Wisconsin, where you don't get that many great hunts for a lot of us, the temptation is to double down and to stay there and really give it a shot. If you're hunting water and there's just a lot of birds, if it's a big body of water, you could switch areas and let the area that you first hunted rest. If it's a huge field, like you're up in Canada and you've got, you know, these huge square mile fields, you could hunt one end after you hunt the other end. But if you're talking a small spot like we had this year, you want to let it rest. We let it rest five days because it's a, it's a long season. Well, not a long season. It's a week, but we let it sit until the last day that we hunted. And we had a great hunt on both of those hunts. So I hope that helps you as you're planning out your upcoming fall. I hope you do not double down on stupid, which is what I tell guys that we're not going to do, which is hunt the same spot two days in a row. Thank you so much for listening to this week's Sporting Dog Adventures. Have a great week and God bless. Sporting Dog Adventures, run, boy, run. Everything you need is here under the sun. Everything you need is here under the sun